The United States military insists they are a fundamental weapon of war. The international community disagrees and says any device that kills or injures mostly children should be banned. And in Rangata, in today's newsmaker, is Donald Trump's decision to lift restrictions on the use of anti-personnel landmines. As the name clearly illustrates, anti-personnel devices are meant to inflict maximum harm to a human body. Designed to explode skyward, they are expertly efficient at blinding, shattering bones, severing limbs and of course killing. They're cheap to produce, easy to plant or drop from the air, but difficult and expensive to clean up. Decades after conflicts end, they live on as deadly remnants of war, hidden killers whose victims are mainly civilians, most of them children. Despite there being more than 100 million of them currently lurking just beneath the surface of the earth, the United States is lifting a ban that would allow them to plant even more. By all accounts, no one in the U.S. military has campaigned for that ban to be lifted. And anti-personnel landmines don't appear to be a strategic asset employed in the theater of war. So what's behind the decision to reintroduce them onto the battlefield? Edra Abbasi explains. These men are survivors of a landmine blast. Some are trying on their prosthetics for the first time. I was farming when the landmine exploded. I lost both my legs and my two fingers. As the war between the Taliban and the Afghan government intensifies, the number of landmine casualties is rising. Thousands of civilians are wounded and killed every year. Despite this, the United States has removed restrictions on their use. Uh, landmines are one of uh, very uh, many other important tools that our commanders need to have available to them on the battlefield to uh, shape the battlefield and to protect our forces. Uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we have uh, all the tools in our toolkit that are uh, legally available and effective to ensure our success and to ensure the protection of our soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines. 164 countries have signed the Mine Ban Treaty. The U.S. is not one of them. But in 2014, former President Barack Obama banned America's military from using landmines everywhere except in South Korea. According to Landmine Monitor, at least 120,000 people were injured or killed in landmine explosions worldwide between 1999 and 2017. Nearly half of them were children. Civilians make up 87% of the casualties. The White House insists landmines will only be used in exceptional circumstances and that they can be disarmed remotely or will self-destruct. But campaigners say this won't guarantee that people will be safe from injury or death. The European Union has criticized America's reversal. It says the ban has saved thousands of lives. So is there any justification for the US reintroducing the use of landmines? Heida Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now in Geneva is Hector Guerra. He's the director of the international campaign to ban landmines and the Cluster Munition Coalition. Rob Maness is in Madisonville, Louisiana. He is a retired United States Air Force colonel who served as a bomber squadron commander during the Iraq War. And Outer Gilbert joins us from London. She is the operations manager at Safe Lane Global, a private public company working to clear landmines and other explosive remnants of war. Good to have you all on the program. Hector Guerra, is this a bad idea? Well, definitely. This is a step backward. Landmines remain a, a global problem. So well, what we see here is um, a loosening of um, restriction that uh, that was a step in the right, right direction. There is no excuse to use or promote the use of these weapons that continue killing, maiming, and uh, affecting livelihoods of thousands of people all over the world. Colonel Maynus, 
Why did the Trump administration do this? Nobody's been requesting it from the military. There doesn't seem to be an urgent need for it. Nobody's calling for it from the battlefield. Why'd they do this now? Well, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, there were a lot of policies in the previous administration uh, from uh, the perspective of the armed forces that were overly restrictive. And the United States had not signed up to the agreement uh, that other countries have signed up to, as you guys have pointed out. Uh, but I would like to start out by saying, hopefully someday, you know, human beings won't make wars on each other and we won't uh, have to have these conversations because this type of uh, weapon is uh, extremely fatal, uh, harms mostly children, as you pointed out, and harms mostly your own forces when uh, you have to go to the battlefield. Uh, so, but looking at the policy that I've had a chance to take a look at some of the details of, uh, it is not a complete lift of the banning of anti-personnel mines as we know them when we think about going out and being parts of volunteer organizations to go clear these mines like uh, the Soviet Union used, or the former Soviet Union used in uh, the Afghanistan war that it fought. Uh, we are not going to allow commanders to use persistent mines. Uh, the uh, reliability of the technology for the self-disarm, self-destruct mechanisms is, is, uh, is really high. It's only six in one million, but th even that's not good enough when you're having to make a decision like this. Alta Gilbert, are you convinced by some of the qualifications and the sort of mitigating circumstances and factors that Colonel Maynus has put in there to say that, well, it's not as clear cut and maybe it might not be as bad as we think? Yes, so um, I've uh, personally, you know, seen a lot of the devastation that, that landmines do um, globally. Um, and, um, you know, anti-personal mine ban convention that came into force in, in 99 have, have had a, a great impact on reducing the numbers of, of casualty. Um, the, the latest statistics is around you know, 5,000 uh, people injured and, and killed per year, uh, which is um, um, a great success in the, in the war against landmines. Um, but uh, when it comes to self-destruction mechanism and the reliability of, of those, you know, we haven't seen uh, anything that can fulfill the, 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 those criteria to date. Do you believe, Alta, that there are criteria that can be fulfilled and that there are some legitimate circumstances in which a country can use these landmines to wage war legally? Uh, personally, I do think it's a slippery slope to, to walk down. You know, a landmine doesn't see the difference between um, a soldier and, and a child. Uh, and um, my, my personal experience uh, from, from working in, in um, these most affected countries is, is saying the opposite. Mm. Colonel Maynus, I want you to have a, a listen to what Save the Children has said about um, reversing this ban. They, they condemned it and they said, not only do we know that the majority of landmines and explosive remnants of war kill civilians, 71%, but more than half of all the civilians who are killed are children, 54%. In places like Afghanistan, the percentage of child casualties is as high as 77%. From Syria and Yemen, to Nigeria and Afghanistan, our field teams meet countless children who have been killed or suffered life-altering injuries caused by landmines and other explosive weapons at a time when the U.S. government should be working to further limit the impact of conflict and better address children's unique needs. The opposite is happening. Colonel Maynus, so the idea is that, okay, while there might be some circumstances in which these might be, you can argue they might be used, the U.S. is going, is swimming against the tide of history is on the wrong side of history here. Do you accept that? No, I don't accept that it's on the wrong side of history. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the 5,000 lives saved uh, by the ban on anti-personnel landmines from uh, 1999, I think is extremely important. But those lives weren't saved from U.S. manufactured landmines that we're talking about with this policy change. They were saved from uh, the old style that are still out there in the millions uh, that we need to continue to clear. And that's why we have these types of restrictive policies. And, uh, and I think I see this so far as a balanced approach uh, to modifying this policy on the use of anti-personnel landmines. Of course, the devil's in the details. And as someone who is in 
in explosive ordnance disposal, bomb disposal, early in my military career, uh, it's extremely important that if, since we are going down this road, that we have to get it right. Unfortunately, war is a messy business, and and uh, getting it right is uh, very difficult to do. Could you give me an example that you can think of in the current circumstances of the U.S. conducting operations anywhere around the world where the loosening of this restriction would make things better? I have to be honest with you, under current operations, uh, I don't believe that the loosening of this restriction is going to make any difference whatsoever uh, in the, our current conflicts. So why the need to do it now? Which brings me back to the beginning of, of the program. Why, why is he doing it now? Is Trump just doing it because this was something that Obama wanted to, to push back on and he wants to reverse it? I, I doubt it. Uh, the, the, again, down at the detail level, I'm be very surprised if Trump actually uh, had the details on this decision uh, before it was implemented. What I think is really going on is what Secretary Esper said in his press conference about it, and that, and that is that uh, it's a tool, it's a very devastating tool, just like a nuclear weapon is a very devastating tool, and uh, the Department of Defense hesitates to remove that tool from the capability of commanders to protect our troops and our allied troops if we have to go into a conflict. Hector Garrett, do you trust the United States to use the tool judiciously, fairly, and without bringing innocent people into harm's way? Well, uh, in our view, a landmine is a landmine. There is no excuse to use it. and. Um, there is always a, a high risk that uh, they will end up killing and maiming, as the ev evidence has shown over decades. So it's opening a Pandora's box, and I think that um, it's a case has been uh, made clear over 20 years ago that uh, these weapons go against the most basic humanitarian principles of distinction, proportionality, and so on. And uh, every country on earth has, is abiding by, mm -hmm. at least in principle, uh, by these standards or should. And, um, and uh, they are so clear that even those countries like the U.S. who are not on board the Ottawa Treaty have, been, uh, have ceased to use, produce, and export these weapons. That was made clear a long time ago. Uh, so it's going against the evidence, and there is no excuse, and there is no good mind, no efficient mind from a humanitarian perspective. So um, I think that uh, we have to put things in context and see uh, that no, there is a, the number of countries jumping on board the treaty has increased. Those who are not have um, ceased to use them, have established moratoria, against his weapons, save certain exceptions like Myanmar or Syria, for right. instance. Right. So they are the, the regimes currently using them, right. serving themselves the right to use these weapons. So I right. think that this is something worth Th That's noting. an interesting point. And, and I wonder, Rob Menes, if you, you find it a little bit difficult to contend with the reality that, according to Human Rights Watch, they've tallied this and they found in recent years, as was mentioned by Hector, we only have Syria, we only have Myanmar and we only have Daesh or ISIS actually actively using landmines. This is the company that you're sort of getting involved with when you're pushing back against the anti-landmine crowd. Yes, we are pushing back against that, uh, against that but we are also in conflict with uh, Daesh, uh, ISIS, uh, uh, and sometimes with Syria, uh, and I would also stipulate that uh, we're not just talking about, uh, when we're talking about use, we're not talking about just manufactured and produced by factory type of mines. Uh, uh, the enemies that uh, uh, I personally have faced uh, around the world have uh, very, very uh, good tactical and strategic use for mining uh, vehicles uh, and uh, to especially go after personnel, and I think we all know that. So we have our own experiences from that perspective, and, and many, many soldier, young soldiers, men and women that have lost arms and legs and lives 
because of this type of activity. It's a devastating tactic and weapon to go to to use, and we advise those that are trying to use it against us not to do it because we'll keep the tool. Yeah, but, but in terms of your tools, don't you have enough weapons of war to use? Why do you have to use this one? Which the evidence shows, as was, was shown by everybody else, that it just kills disproportionately too many civilians, especially children. So don't you have more than enough ways to wage wars? Why do you have to go back to something that is archaic? Again, we're not talking about the same technology that the uh, ban on anti-personnel mines uh, at the beginning was talking about. We're talking about uh, new technologies, new types of weaponry that have a very high reliability of self-disarm and self-destruct. Uh, and this policy appears uh, to be uh, very limited in scope uh, and just replacing the tool set uh, back in the toolbox for the military commander to protect uh, Americans. Right. Okay, so okay, so Outer Gilbert, let's talk about the technology here. The the new mines they will self destruct within thirty days. This is from the Pentagon. I'm I'm reading it from from the statement, and they can be destroyed in as little as two hours if necessary. Do you do you buy that? Do you accept that this might not be the 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 traditional conventional crude landmine that that we spoke of in the past? Well, if we're looking at the, the issues that we are dealing with um, around the world in terms of, a, of a removing this threat, you know, the, the countries that we're facing a problem with antipersonal mines are, are reducing, which then again shows the, the success of implementation of the Antipersonal Mine Bank Convention. We're more dealing with, with um, cluster munition, uh, IEDs, uh, and, and those kind of, kind of weapons. Um, and, you know, by introducing... Um, even though an enhanced version of an, an um, antipersonal landmine, um, I, I believe that that is that is risky because you know even if you you um, you have something high tech and, and expensive, you know these items still tend to to fail. Um, and then if they do, uh, they're out there, and you don't know how many that have failed. Um, and then that will block land for 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 people then coming back and going to use those areas. Uh, maps are rarely available, and if they are available of the location of these mines, um, they are often available many years after, uh, inaccurate and, and so on. So I, I, I just see we, you know, potentially repeating history here. And it's failed to see how any positive aspects uh, to a nation adopting a policy of increasing the use of landmines. Um, uh, yeah. Colonel Manis, are you convinced by any of that? Uh, no, quite frankly, I'm not. Uh, the uh, the information and data just doesn't support that position. Uh, the reliability of the self-destruct, self-disarm mechanisms of the devices that we've developed and we're using uh, is extremely high, as I said, uh, six in one million. Uh, now, having said that, uh, you know, those of us that have been in the military are just as concerned as the other folks that are trying to clear old landmine fields. Uh, the the comment about the mapping and everything is a challenge that we have all faced when trying to help uh, countries recover from war where these types of mines have been used. And we'll continue to try to uh, help with that. And from our perspective, uh, we have, uh, when we use uh, any type of mining, uh, we try to make very accurate and detailed mapping to be made available eventually. Unfortunately, uh, during the conflict is very difficult, so the timelines are very long, so I agree with your other guests on that. Uh, and we have to continue to address those challenges, especially in the areas where anti-personnel mines have been seeded and are still out there by the millions, and they're killing uh, mostly children. Hector Guerra, when an argument is made that if you're in a conflict and you're fighting a group such as Daesh, and they are using landmines, sometimes you have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and do the same. Your response to that is what? That's unacceptable. I think that, uh, if anything, we need to, to strengthen uh, uh, the rule of law at the international level and all the agreed principles under multilateralism and the construction of international law. At the end of the day, that's, uh, the, those are means to an end of uh, uh, reducing freedom from fear. And um, I think that um, 
we've seen how these uh, non-state armed groups have been using uh, landmines and um, there are still several cases uh, where even if they are improvised in nature uh, they are victim activated and they have been using they have been used in different uh, contexts and we see what's the the human uh, toll of that so uh, I think it's unacceptable and um, um, there is no um, over the years we've seen how uh, modern warfare is coming closer to where people live. So we see millions and millions of people exposed to armed violence resulting from armed conflict. So bringing again or having a renewed use of landmines mm -hmm. uh, has to be, um, in, in this context, well, quite frankly, that's a, a serious risk and an escalation of uh, an existing problem. A problem that has been reduced over the year of the years worldwide, even though there have been renewed, uh, there have been new cases such as uh, in Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, where they have been used, or other contexts where they have been used by uh, non-state armed groups. But um, where, are, what are we aiming for? Where are we going uh, when there is a uh, new legitimacy for these nefarious weapons? Right, and Hector, one of the exceptions to um, the rollback of Obama in, in 2014, even though they imposed the restrictions, the main exception was the demilitarized zone, right? Between South and North Korea. In that context, they were still allowed. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on that, to say, well, this is the most militarized place on earth, and that for multiple reasons, mainly because of the, the, the threat coming from the North Korean side, that place was okay to be heavily mined. Are you against that? So, um, so once again, there is no excuse for the, the use or, uh, of landmines, um, irrespective of the rational uh, uh, portrayed by each state in the context or uh, of its own uh, national security or international uh, commitments, but I think that at the end of the day, uh, the threat, uh, landmines pose a threat, and um, there is there shouldn't be any exception right. to to this to to the use of uh, landmines, even uh, in a context such as the one in the Korean Peninsula. Rob Maynus, election season, and we've heard from Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Mike Bloomberg. They all said they would scrap this policy. Bernie Sanders saying Trump's landmine policy reversal is barbaric, it weakens America's moral leadership, and is quite simply a giveaway to the military-industrial complex. So I'm guessing if there's a Democratic president come the end of the year, this is gone. This is politics, right? Sure, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but uh, remember, in American presidential races, quite often candidates say things on the campaign trail uh, aimed at their voters to, so they can win. And once they win and they get in and they actually review the policies, and, uh, and that's what I think has happened here. It's been, it's, this is part of a policy review. Uh, and they make decisions uh, based on uh, the facts that they now know once they get in office, uh, and they may or may not change this policy because of that. Auda Gilbert, your message to U.S. President Donald Trump, who's enacted this, implemented this, you're against it. What do you think? Um, and I think we, we also need to think a little bit longer here. We're looking at, you know, people being killed and, and, and injured by, by these landmines. And that's, of course, the, the most severe um, effect. But then you also have the, the issue of, of land blockage. And um, it, I don't know, have the insight into how these specific mines will work, but if there is a suspicion that mines are still in a specific area, that means that local people will, will not use it just because of the fear of these landmines might be in there. Um, I think we should we should follow the, the success to date of the Antipas Mine Bank Convention and, and um, not uh, um, start to, to lifting these restrictions. Yeah. Colonel Maynus? Well, hopefully someday, as I said at the beginning of our talk, uh, human beings will stop making war on each other and stop using barbaric weapons uh, of any type uh, to kill our children. 
uh, and kill each other. And uh, we hope that uh, someday uh, we won't have to have a policy that talks about weapons like this because they won't be necessary. There's a minute left on the program, Hector. I'm going to give you the final contribution. Very briefly, please. Thank you very much. Well, um, it's um, heartening to see how the global community is reacting to this, how even um, allies of the United States have uh, expressed uh, their reaction re regretting this change in policy. Civil society in the international, com uh, in the international campaign to ban landmines, including survivors, um, are reacting to this and uh, expressing their um, concern mm -hmm. and uh, the horror uh, against uh, this change in policy directly to the United States uh, in embassies uh, around the world, and um, I, uh, we, we hope that, um, that this will have a multiplying effect and that um, as this change took place, there will be a new change um, uh, to prevent the use of these weapons. Okay. And uh, Hector, I've got a wrap. let's remember right. there is a global movement establishing a global norm right. against these weapons. Okay. Hector, Colonel Rob Maynus and Ota Gilbert, it's been a pleasure having you all on the Newsmakers. Thanks so much for joining us and thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.